16 realms of existence. The origin of the world. There is no reason to suppose that the world had a beginning at all. The idea that things must have a beginning is really due to the poverty of our thoughts. Bertrand Russell. There are three schools of thought regarding the origin of the world. The first school of thought claims that this world came into existence by nature and that nature is not an intelligent force. However, nature works on its own accord and goes on changing. The second school of thought says that the world was created by an almighty God who is responsible for everything. The third school of thought says that the beginning of this world and of life is inconceivable since they have neither beginning nor end. Buddhism is in accordance with this third school of thought. Bertrand Russell supports this school of thought by saying, there is no reason to suppose that the world had a beginning at all. The idea that things must have a beginning is really due to the poverty of our thoughts. Modern science says that some millions of years ago, the gradually cooled earth was lifeless and that life originated in the ocean. Buddhism has never claimed that the world, sun, moon, stars, wind, water, days and nights were created by a powerful god or by a Buddha. Buddhists believe that the world was not created once upon a time, but that the world has been created millions of times every second and will continue to do so by itself and will eventually by itself. According to Buddhism, world systems always appear, change, decay and disappear in the universe in a never-ending cycle. H.G. Wells, in A.S. Hort History of the World, says it is universally recognized that the universe in which we live, has to all appearances, existed for an enormous period of time and possibly for endless time. But that the universe in which we live, has existed only for six or seven thousand years may be regarded as an altogether exploded idea. No life seems to have happened suddenly upon Earth. The efforts made by many religions to explain the beginning and the end of the universe are indeed ill-conceived. The position of religions which propound the view that the universe was created by God in an exactly fixed year, has become a difficult one to maintain in the light of modern and scientific knowledge. Today scientists, historians, astronomers, biologists, botanists, anthropologists, and great thinkers have all contributed vast new knowledge about the origin of the world. This latest discovery and knowledge is not at all contradictory to the teachings of the Buddha. Bertrand Russell again says that he respects the Buddha for not making false statements like others who committed themselves regarding the origin of the world. The speculative explanations of the origin of the universe that are presented by various religions are not acceptable to the modern scientists and intellectuals. On the other hand, even the commentaries of the Buddhist scriptures, written by certain Buddhist writers, cannot be challenged by scientific thinking in regard to this question. The Buddha did not waste his time on this issue although he did make passing references to the magnitude of the cosmos. His main aim was to help his disciples escape from suffering in samsara. The reason for his silence was that this issue has no religious value for gaining spiritual wisdom. The explanation of the origin of the universe is not a spiritual concern. Such theorizing is not necessary for living a righteous way of life and for shaping our future lives. However, if one insists on studying this subject, then one must investigate the sciences, astronomy, geology, biology, and anthropology. These sciences can offer more reliable and tested information on this subject than can be supplied by any religion. The purpose of a religion is to cultivate the life here in this world and hereafter until liberation is gained and not merely to satisfy our curiosity about the operation of the universe. To the Buddha, the world is nothing but samsara the cycle of repeated births and deaths. To him, the beginning of the world and the end of the world is within this samsara. Since elements and energies are relative and interdependent, it is meaningless to single out anything as the beginning. Whatever speculation we make regarding the origin of the world, there is no absolute truth in our notion. Infinite is the sky, infinite is the number of beings, infinite are the worlds in the vast universe. Infinite in wisdom the Buddha teaches these, infinite are the virtues of him who teaches these. Sri Ramachandra One day a man called Malunkyaputta approached the Buddha and demanded that he explain the origin of the universe. He even threatened to cease to be his follower if the Buddha did not reveal this. 
The Buddha calmly retorted that it was of no consequence to him whether or not Malunkyaputta followed him, because the truth did not need anyone's support. Then the Buddha said that he would not go into a discussion of the origin of the universe. To him, gaining knowledge about such matters was a waste of time because a man's task was to liberate himself from suffering. To illustrate this, the enlightened one related the parable of a man who was shot by a poisoned arrow. This foolish man refused to have the arrow removed until he found out all about the person who shot the arrow. By the time his attendants discovered these unnecessary details, the man was dead. Similarly, our immediate task is to attain nirvana, not to worry about the beginning or the end of the world. And all that is necessary to escape from rebirth into a suffering existence is taught in the Four Noble Truths. Anything beyond these truths was not the concern of the Buddha, just as knowledge of the origin of water is not necessary to quench one's thirst. Other World Systems In the light of modern, scientific discoveries, we can appreciate the limitations of the human world and accept the hypothesis that other world systems can exist in other parts of the universe. On certain occasions, when the Buddha knew that the listeners was intellectually ready to understand, he did comment on the nature and composition of the universe. According to him, other forms of life exist in other parts of the universe. The Buddha has mentioned that there are 31 planes of existence within the universes. They are Four states of unhappiness or subhuman realms, life in hells, animal life, ghost worlds, and demon worlds. One human world. Six Devalokas or heavenly realms. Sixteen Rupalokas or realms of fine material forms. Four Arupalokas or formless realms. The existence of these other world systems is yet to be confirmed by modern science. However, Modern scientists are now working with the hypothesis that there is a possibility of other forms of life existing on other planets. As a result of today's rapid scientific progress, we may soon find some living beings on other planets in the remotest parts of the galaxy. Perhaps, we will find them subject to the same laws as ourselves. They might be physically quite different in appearance, elements, and chemical composition and exist in different dimensions. They might be far superior to us or they might be far inferior. Why should the planet Earth be the only planet to contain life forms? Earth is a tiny speck in a huge universe. Sir James Jeans, a distinguished astrophysicist, estimates the whole universe to be about 1,000 million times as big as the area of space that is visible through the telescope. In his book, The Mysterious Universe, he states that the total number of universes is probably something like the total number of grains of sand on all the seashores of the world. In such a cosmos, the planet Earth is only one millionth of a grain of sand. He also informs us that the light from the sun, which takes about eight minutes to travel the 93 million miles to Earth, probably takes something like 100,000 million years to travel across the universe. Such is the vastness of the cosmos. When we consider the vastness of the many universes making up what is popularly known as outer space, the hypothesis that other world systems might exist is scientifically feasible. In the light of modern scientific discoveries, we can appreciate the limitations of the human world. Today, science has demonstrated that our human world exists within the limitations of the vibrational frequencies that can be received by our sense organs. And science has also shown us that there are other vibrational frequencies which are above or below our range of reception. With the discovery of radio waves, X-rays, TV waves, and microwaves, we can appreciate the extremely limited vision that is imposed on us by our sense organs. We peep out at the universe through the crack allowed by our sense organs, just as a little child peeps out through the crack in the door. This awareness of our limited perception demonstrates to us the possibility that other world systems may exist that are separate from ours or that interpenetrate with ours. In Hamlet, Shakespeare says there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in thy philosophy. How true! As to the nature of the universe, the Buddha said that the beginning and ending of the universe is inconceivable. Buddhists do not believe that there is such thing as the complete destruction of the whole universe at once. When a certain section of the universe disappears, another section remains. 
when the other section disappears, yet another section reappears or evolves out of the dispersed matters of the previous universe. This is formed by the accumulation of molecules, basic elements, gas, and numerous energies, a combination supported by cosmic impulsion and gravity. Then some other new world systems appear and exist for some time. This is the nature of the cosmic energies. This is why the Buddha says that the beginning and the end of the universe are inconceivable. It was only on certain, special occasions, that the Buddha commented on the nature and composition of the universe. When he spoke, he had to address himself to the understanding capacity of the inquirer. The Buddha was not interested in the kind of metaphysical speculation that did not lead to higher spiritual development and insight. He knew that a clever person who talks a lot is not necessarily a wise person. Buddhists do not share the view held by some people that the world will be destroyed by a god, when there are more non-believers and more corruptions taking place amongst the human beings. With regard to this belief people can ask, instead of destroying with his power, why can't this god use the same power to influence people to become believers and to wipe out all immoral practices? Whether god destroys or not, it is natural that one day there will be an end to everything that comes into existence. And the process will continue indefinitely. In the language of the Buddha, the world is nothing more than the combination, existence, disappearance, and recombination of mind and matter, Namarupa. In the final analysis, the teaching of the Buddha goes beyond the discoveries of modern science however startling or impressive they may be. In science, the knowledge of the universe is to enable humanity to master it for material comfort and personal safety. But the Buddha teaches that no amount of factual knowledge can ultimately free mankind from the pain of existence. A person must strive alone and diligently until he or she arrives at a true understanding of his or her own nature and of the changeable nature of the cosmos. To be truly free a person must seek to tame the mind, to destroy craving for sensual pleasure. When one truly understands that the universe one is trying to conquer is impermanent, one will see oneself as Don Quixote fighting windmills. With this right view of oneself, one will spend one's time and energy conquering the mind and destroying the illusion of self without wasting effort on unimportant and unnecessary issues. The Buddhist Concept of Heaven and Hell Wise people make their own heaven while foolish people create their own hell here and hereafter. The Buddhist concept of heaven and hell is entirely different from that in other religions. Buddhists do not accept that these places are eternal. It is unreasonable to condemn a person to eternal hell for his or her human weakness but quite reasonable to give a person every chance to develop him or herself. From the Buddhist point of view, those who go to hell can work themselves upwards by making use of the merit that they had acquired previously. There are no locks on the gates of hell. Hell is a temporary place and there is no reason for those beings to suffer there forever. The Buddha's teaching shows us that there are heavens and hells not only beyond this world, but in this very world itself. Thus the Buddhist conception of heaven and hell is very reasonable. For instance, the Buddha once said, when the average ignorant person makes an assertion to the effect that there is a hell, Patela, under the ocean he is making a statement which is false and without basis. The word hell is a term for painful sensations. The idea of one particular ready-made place or a place created by God as heaven and hell is not acceptable to the Buddhist concept. The fire of hell in this world is hotter than that of any possible hell in the world beyond. There is no fire equal to anger, lust or greed and ignorance. According to the Buddha, we are burning from eleven kinds of physical pain and mental agony, lust, hatred, illusion, sickness, decay, death, worry, lamentation, pain, physical and mental, melancholy and grief. People can burn the entire world with some of these fires of mental discord. From a Buddhist point of view, the easiest way to define hell and heaven is that wherever there is more suffering, either in this world or any other plane, that place is a hell to those who suffer. And where there is more pleasure or happiness, either in this world or any other plane of existence, that place is a heaven to those who enjoy their worldly life in that particular place. However, as the human realm is a mixture of both pain and happiness, 
human beings experience both pain and happiness and will be able to realize the real nature of life. But in many other planes of existence inhabitants have less chance for this realization. In certain places there is more suffering than pleasure while in some other places there is more pleasure than suffering. Buddhists believe that after death rebirth can take place in any one of a number of possible existences. This future existence is conditioned by the last thought moment a person experiences at the point of death. This last thought which determines the next existence results from the past actions of a man either in this life or before that. Hence, if the predominant thought reflects meritorious action, then he or she will find the future existence in a happy state. But that state is temporary and when it is exhausted a new life must begin all over again. Determined by another dominating karmic energy which lies dormant in the subconscious mind, waiting for the right conditions to become active. This is very much like a seed waiting for rain and sunshine to sprout. This repetitious process goes on endlessly unless one arrives at right view and makes a firm resolve to follow the noble path which produces the ultimate happiness of nirvana. Heaven is a temporary place where those who have done good deeds experience more sensual pleasures for a longer period. Hell is another temporary place where those evildoers experience more physical and mental suffering. It is not justifiable to believe that such places are permanent. There is no God behind the scene of heaven and hell. Each and every person experiences pain or pleasure according to good and bad karma. Buddhists never try to introduce Buddhism by frightening people through hellfire or enticing people by pointing to paradise. Their main purpose is character building and mental training. Buddhists can practice their religion without aiming at heaven or without developing fear of hell. Their duty is to lead righteous lives by upholding humane qualities and peace of mind. Belief in Deities, Devas Buddhists do not deny the existence of various gods or deities. Devas are more fortunate than human beings as far as sensual pleasures are concerned. They also possess certain powers which human beings usually lack. However, the powers of these deities are limited because they are also transitory beings. They exist in happy abodes and enjoy their life for a longer period than human beings do. When they have exhausted all the effects of their good karma, which they gathered during previous births, these deities pass away and are reborn somewhere else according to their residual good and bad karma earned on previous lives. According to the Buddha, human beings have more opportunities to accrue merits to be born in a better condition. And the deities have fewer chances in this respect since they are more concerned with sensual pleasures. Buddhists do not attribute any specific importance to such gods. They do not regard the deities as a support for the moral development or as a support for the attainment of salvation of nirvana. Whether they are great or small, both human beings and deities are perishable and subject to rebirth. Therefore, we share a common destiny with the gods. It is a common belief amongst the Buddhist public that such deities can be influenced to grant their favors by inviting them to share the merits we accrue whenever meritorious deeds are performed. This belief is based on the Buddha's injunction to the deities to protect those human beings who lead a religious way of life. This is the reason why Buddhists invite these deities to share the merits or remember them whenever they do some meritorious deeds. However, making of offerings to and worshipping such deities are not encouraged as a means to salvation, although some Buddhist customs center around such activities. When people are in great difficulties, they naturally turn to the deities to express their grievances in a place of worship. By doing this, they gain some relief and consolation, in their hearts, they feel much better. However, to an intellectual who has strong willpower, sound education and understanding, such beliefs and actions need not be resorted to. There is definitely no teaching in Buddhism to the effect that Buddhists can attain nirvana by praying to any deity. Buddhists believe that purity and impurity depend on oneself. No one from outside can purify another. Dhammapada 165 Buddhahood and nirvana can be attained without any help from an external source. Therefore, Buddhists can practice their religion with or without the deities. Existence of Spirits There are visible and invisible beings or spirits in the same way as there are visible and invisible lights. 
Buddhism does not deny the existence of good and evil spirits. There are visible and invisible beings or spirits in the same way as there are visible and invisible lights. We need special instruments to see the invisible light and we need a special sense to see the invisible beings. One cannot deny the existence of such spirits just because one is unable to see them with one's naked eyes. These spirits are also subject to birth and death. They are not going to stay permanently in the spirit form. They too exist in the same world where we live a genuine Buddhist is one who molds his life according to moral causation discovered by the Buddha. He or she should not be concerned with the worshipping of these gods and spirits. However, this kind of worshipping is of some interest and fascination to the multitude and has naturally brought some Buddhists into contact with these activities. Regarding protection from evil spirits, goodness is a shield against evil. Goodness is a wall through which evil cannot penetrate unless the good person opens the door to an evil influence. Even though a person leads a truly virtuous and holy life and has a good shield of moral and noble living that person can still lower the shield of protection by believing in the power of evil that can bring harm. The Buddha never advised his followers to worship such spirits or to be frightened of them. The Buddhist attitude towards them is to transfer merits and to radiate loving-kindness to them. Buddhists do not harm them. On the other hand, if person is religious, virtuous, and pure in mind, and is also intelligent and possesses strong willpower and understanding capacity, then such a person could be deemed to be much stronger than spirits. The evil spirits will keep away and the good spirits will protect him or her. The Significance of Transference of Merits to the Departed If you really want to honor and help your departed ones, then do some meritorious deeds in their name and transfer the merits to them. According to Buddhism, good deeds or acts of merit bring happiness to the doer both in this world and in the hereafter. Acts of merit are also believed to lead towards the final goal of everlasting happiness. The acts of merit can be performed through body, speech, or mind. Every good deed produces merit, store of positive spiritual well-being, which accumulates to the credit of the doer. Buddhism also teaches that the acquired merit can be transferred to others, it can be shared vicariously with others. In other words, the merit is transferable and so can be shared with other persons. The persons who receive the merit can be either living or departed ones. The method for transferring merits is quite simple. First some good deeds are performed. The doer of the good deeds has merely to wish that the merit gained accrues to someone in particular. This wish can be purely mental or it can be accompanied by an expression of words. The wish could be made with the beneficiary being aware of it. When the beneficiary is aware of the act or wish, then a mutual rejoicing in merit takes place. Here the beneficiary becomes a participant of the original deed by associating him or herself with the deed done. If the beneficiary identifies him or herself with both the deed and the doer, he or she can sometimes acquire even greater merit than the original doer. Either because the elation is greater or because the appreciation of the value of the deed is based on an understanding of Dharma. Buddhist texts contain several stories of such instances. The joy of transference of merits can also take place with or without the knowledge of the doer of the meritorious act. All that is necessary is for the beneficiary to feel gladness in the heart when he or she becomes aware of the good deed. If one wishes, one can express joy by saying sadhu which means well done. What is being done is creating a kind of mental or verbal applause. In order to share the good deed done by another, what is important is that there must be actual approval of the deed and joy arising in the beneficiary's heart. Even if so desired, the doer of a good deed cannot prevent another's rejoicing in the merit because he or she has no power over another's thoughts. According to the Buddha, in all actions, thought is what really matters. Transference is primarily an act of the mind. To transfer merit does not mean that a person is deprived of the merit originally acquired from his or her good deed. On the contrary, the very act of transference is a good deed in itself and hence enhances the merit already earned. Highest Gift to the Departed the Buddha says that the greatest gift one can confer on one's dead ancestors is to perform acts of merit and to transfer these merits so acquired. He also says that those who give also receive the fruits of their deeds. 
the Buddha encouraged those who did good deeds such as offering alms to holy men, to transfer the merits which they received to their departed ones. Alms should be given in the name of the departed by recalling to mind such things as, when he was alive, he gave me this wealth, he did this for me, he was my relative, my companion, etc., Tirakutta Sutra Kadakapatha. There is no use weeping, feeling sorry, lamenting and wailing, such attitudes are of no consequence to the departed ones. Transferring merits to the departed is based on the popular belief that on a person's death, his or her merits and demerits are weighed against one another and destiny is thus determined. Lifetime actions determine whether one is to be reborn in a sphere of happiness or a realm of woe. The belief is that the departed one might have gone to an existence in the spirit world. The beings in these lower forms of existence cannot generate fresh merits, and have to live on the merits which are earned from this world. Those who did not harm others and who performed many good deeds during their lifetime will certainly have the chance to be reborn in a happy place. Such persons do not require the help of living relatives. However, those who have no chance to be reborn in a happy abode are always waiting to receive merits from their living relatives to offset their deficiency and to enable them to be born in a happy abode. Those who are reborn in an unfortunate spirit form could be released from their suffering condition through the transferring of merits to them by friends and relatives who do some meritorious deeds. What happens is really quite understandable. When the dead person becomes aware that someone has remembered him or her, then he or she becomes glad, and this happiness relieves the suffering. As there is greater happiness accrued from repeatedly being remembered, the unhappy birth is transformed to a happy one. It has all to do with the power of the mind. This injunction of the Buddha to transfer merits to departed ones is the counterpart of the Hindu custom which has come down through the ages. Various ceremonies are performed so that the spirits of dead ancestors might live in peace. This custom has had a tremendous influence on the social life of certain Buddhist communities. The dead are always remembered when any good deed is done, and more on occasions connected with their lives, such as their birth or death anniversaries. On such occasions, there is a ritual which is generally practiced. The transferer pours water from a jug or other similar vessel into a receptacle, while repeating a Pali formula which is translated as follows. As rivers, when full must flow and reach and fill the distant main, so indeed what is given here will reach and bless the spirits there. As water poured on mountain top must soon descend and fill the plain so indeed what is given here will reach and bless the spirits there. Nidhikanda Sutta Kadakapatha The origin and the significance of transference of merit is open to scholarly debate. Although this ancient custom still exists today in many Buddhist countries, very few Buddhists who follow it understand the meaning of transference of merits and the proper way to do it. Some people simply waste time and money on meaningless ceremonies and performances in memory of departed ones. These people do not realize that it is impossible to help the departed ones simply by building big graveyards, tombs, paper houses, and other paraphernalia. Neither is it possible to help the departed by burning joss sticks, joss paper, etc., nor is it possible to help the departed by slaughtering animals and offering them along with other kinds of food. Also one should not waste by burning things used by the departed ones on the assumption that the deceased persons would somehow benefit by the act, when such articles can in fact be distributed among the needy. The only way to help the departed ones is to do some meritorious deeds in a religious way in memory of them. The meritorious deeds include such acts as giving alms to others, building schools, temples, orphanages, libraries, hospitals, printing religious books for free distribution and similar charitable deeds. The followers of the Buddha should act wisely and should not follow anything blindly. While others pray to God for the departed ones, Buddhists radiate their loving-kindness directly to them. By doing meritorious deeds, they can transfer the merits to their beloved ones for their well-being. This is the best way of remembering and giving real honor to and perpetuating the names of the departed ones. In their state of happiness, the departed ones will reciprocate their blessings on their living relatives. It is, therefore, the duty of relatives to remember their departed ones by transferring merits and by radiating loving-kindness directly to them.
17 Divination and Dreams Astrology and Astronomy I believe in astrology but not astrologers. From the very beginning of time people have been fascinated by the stars and they have always tried to find some links between them and their own destiny. Observation of the stars and their movements gave rise to two very important areas of study, namely, astronomy and astrology. Astronomy can be considered a pure science which is concerned with the measurements of distances. The evolution and destruction of stars, their movements, and so on. Of course all these calculations are always made in relation to planet Earth and how these interplanetary movements affect mankind on a physical level. Modern astronomy seeks to find answers to the still unanswered questions regarding the origin of humanity and the final, possible end of existence of the human race. It is a fascinating area of study and our new knowledge of the universe and the galaxies has put much pressure on many religions to evaluate their age-old postulations regarding the creator and the creation of life. Buddhism does not face any dilemma, simply because the Buddha did not encourage his followers to speculate on things beyond their comprehension. However, he has made many illusions which in the light of our new knowledge gained through science. Show us that the Buddha was very much aware of the true nature of the universe, that it was never created in one glorious moment, that the earth is merely a tiny, even unimportant speck in all of space. That there is constant creation and destruction, and that everything is in constant motion. The Buddha categorized the whole universe into three groups, planets where living beings exist, planets where only material elements exist and space. Astrology, however, is a completely different area of study altogether. Ever since early people began to think, they were deeply concerned about their relationship with the universe. When human societies became involved in agricultural activities they progressed from hunting as a livelihood and began to notice a link between the movement of the sun through the years and their own activities of planting, harvesting, and similar projects. As people became more sophisticated they were able to predict the movement of the sun and invented time measurement, dividing it into years, months, days, hours, minutes, and seconds. People associated this knowledge with existence whereby they felt that there was a relationship between the life cycle and the movement of the planets. That gave rise to the zodiac the apparent path of the sun in the sky. It contained 12 constellations. A study of these movements in relation to a human being's personal life is called a horoscope. The study of astrology involves a great understanding of human nature, an ability to assess planetary movements precisely, together with an insight into the seemingly unexplainable phenomena in the universe. There have been many brilliant astrologers in the past and some exist even today. Unfortunately, there are an even larger number of charlatans who give astrology a bad name. They hoodwink people by predicting seemingly true events about their future. They make large sums of money by exploiting the ignorance and fear of the gullible. As a result, for a long time scientists scoffed at astrology and did not depend on it. However, their hostile attitude is not really justifiable. The main purpose of reading a horoscope should be to give one an insight into one's own character, in the same way that an X-ray photograph can show the physical makeup of a person. Statistics have shown that the influence of the sun in the signs of the zodiac accounts for the birth of unusual people during certain months. The doing of certain crimes had been found to correspond with zodiac signs in which the sun is moving during certain months of the year. Thus an understanding of this relationship will help people to plot their lives more meaningfully in harmony with their innate tendencies, so that there is less friction as they go through life. A newborn baby is like a seed. It contains within itself all the ingredients which will make it a similar, yet completely different individual from all its fellow human beings. How its potential is developed depends, like the seed, on the kind of nurture it receives. The nature of a person is born within him or her. But free will determines whether he or she will make really good use of talents and abilities. Whether a person will overcome the potential for vice or weakness depends on how he or she is trained in youth. If we recognize our nature our tendency towards laziness, irritability, worries, frustrations, wickedness, cunningness, jealousy we can take positive steps to overcome them. 
The first step in solving problems is to recognize them for what they are. Astrological interpretations indicate our inclinations and tendencies. Once pointed out, we must take the necessary steps to chart our lives in a manner that will make us useful citizens of the world. Even a person with criminal tendencies can become a saint. If he or she recognizes his or her nature and takes steps to lead a good life. A horoscope is a chart drawn to show the karmic force a person carries, calculated from the time of birth. The force determines the time of a birth and knowing this time, a skillful astrologer can quite accurately chart a person's destiny within a given lifespan. Everybody knows that the earth takes approximately one year to move around the sun. This movement, viewed from the earth, places the sun in various zodiacal areas during the year. A person is born, not accidentally, but as a result of karmic influence, when the sun is said to be on transit in one of the twelve zodiacal signs, of course this is a conventional manner of explaining the phenomenon. Even a child knows today that the sun does not move. Through the horoscope you can determine certain times in your life when you have to slow down, or push yourself to great levels of creativity, or when you have to watch your activities and health. Buddhist Attitude Towards Astrology The question most people ask is whether Buddhism accepts or rejects astrology. Strictly speaking, the Buddha did not make any direct pronouncement on this subject because as in many other cases, he stated that discussion on matters such as these do not pertain to spiritual development. Buddhism, unlike some other religions, does not condemn astrology and people are free to use the knowledge they can get from it to make their lives more meaningful. If we study the Buddha's teaching carefully, we will come to accept that a proper and intelligent understanding of astrology can be a useful tool. There is a direct link between the life of an individual human being and the vast workings of the cosmos. Modern science is in accordance with the teachings of Buddhism. We know for example that there is a close link between the movement of the moon and our own behavior. This is seen especially among mentally disturbed and abnormally violent people. It is also true that certain sicknesses like asthma and bronchitis are aggravated when the moon waxes. There is, therefore, sufficient basis for us to believe that other planets can also influence our lives. However there is no need to believe divine spirits are involved in these matters. Buddhism accepts that there is an immense cosmic energy which pulsates through every living thing, including plants. This energy interacts with the karmic energy which an individual generates and determines the course that a life will take. The birth of an individual is not the first creation of a life. But the continuation of one that had always existed and will continue to exist so long as the karmic energy is not quelled through final liberation in the unconditioned state. Now, for a life to manifest itself in a new existence, certain factors, namely seasons, germinal order, and nature must be fulfilled. These are supported by mental energy and karmic energy and all these elements are in constant interaction and interdependent with each other resulting in incessant constant changes to a human being's life. According to astrologers, the time at which a person is born is predetermined by the cosmic energy and the karmic energy. Hence, it can be concluded that life is not merely accidental, it is the result of the interaction between an individual's karma and the universal energy force. The course of a human life is predetermined, caused partly by a being's own actions in the past and the energies that activate the cosmos. Once started, a life is controlled by the interaction between these two forces even to the moment at which a rebirth takes place. A skillful astrologer then, as one who understands cosmic as well as karmic influence, can reasonably accurately chart the course of one's life, based on the moment of the person's birth. We say reasonably accurately because only a Buddha can predict anything with perfect accuracy. While we are in one sense at the mercy of these forces, the Buddha has pointed out a way through which we can escape its influence. All karmic energies are stored in the subconscious mind normally described as mental purities and impurities. Since karmic forces influence one's destiny, a person can develop the mind and negate certain evil influences caused by previous bad karma. A person can also purify the mind and rid himself or herself of all karmic energies and thus prevent rebirth. When there is no rebirth, 
there is no potential life and there will consequently be no future existence which can be predicted or charted. At such a stage of spiritual and mental development, one will have transcended the need to know about life because most imperfections and unsatisfactoriness would have been removed. A highly developed human being will have no need for a horoscope. Since the beginning of the 20th century, psychologists and psychiatrists have come to recognize that there is much more to the human mind than the hardcore materialists have been ready to accept. There is more to the world than can be seen and touched. The famous Swiss psychologist, Carl Jung, used to cast the horoscopes of his patients. On one occasion when he made an astrological analysis of about 500 marriages, he discovered that the findings of Ptolemy, on which modern Western astrology is based, were still valid. That favorable aspects between the sun and the moon of the different partners did produce happy marriages. A well-known French psychologist, Michel Gaglin, who originally held a negative view of astrology, made a survey of about 20,000 horoscopical analyses and found to his surprise that the characteristics of the person studied coincided with characterizations produced by modern psychological methods. The planting of certain flowers, trees, and vegetables at different times of a year will produce differences in strength or appearance of the plants. So there is no reason to doubt that people born in certain times of the year will have different characteristics from people born at other times. By knowing one's weaknesses, failures, and shortcomings, one can do one's best to overcome them and make oneself a better and more useful person to society. It will also help him or her a great deal to get rid of unhappiness and disappointments. Going away from the country where a person is born for example, can sometimes help one avoid the influence of the stars. Shakespeare says, the fault is not in our stars but in ourselves. A well-known astrologer has said, the stars impel, they do not compel. Saint Thomas Aquinas says, the planets influence the more elemental part of man than passions. But Buddhism teaches that through the intellect a person can arrange his or her life in harmony with the planets, and also cultivate inherent talents and manipulate them for his or her personal betterment. Astrology cannot automatically solve all your problems. You must do that yourself. Just like a doctor who can diagnose the nature of a disease, an astrologer can only show certain aspects of your life and character. After that it is left to you to adjust your way of life. Of course, the task will be made easier, knowing what it is you are up against. Some people are too dependent on astrology. They run to the astrologer every time something happens or if they have a dream. Remember, even today astrology is very much an imperfect science and even the best astrologers can make serious mistakes. Use astrology intelligently, just as you would use any tool which would make your life more comfortable and more enjoyable. Above all, beware of fake astrologers who are out to cheat you by telling you not the truth, but what you want to hear. Do not expect good luck to come to you or be handed to you easily without any effort on your part. If you want to reap the harvest, you must sow the seed and it must be the right seed. Remember, opportunity knocks at the door, but never break the lock to gain entrance. Fortune Telling and Charms Hard work is the luckiest star. Although Buddhism does not refute belief in deities, spirits, astrology, and fortune-telling, the Buddha's advice was that people should not be slaves to any of those forces. A good Buddhist can overcome all difficulties by knowing how to make use of intelligence and willpower. The above-mentioned beliefs have no spiritual significance or value. A person must overcome all problems and difficulties by his or her own efforts and not through the medium of deities, spirits, astrology, or fortune-telling. In one of the Buddhist Jataka stories, the Bodhisattva said, The fool may watch for lucky days. Yet luck he shall always miss. The luck itself is luck's own star. What can mere stars achieve? He believed that hard work was the luckiest star and one should not waste time by consulting stars and lucky days in order to achieve success. To do your best to help yourself is better than to rely solely on the stars or external sources. Although some Buddhists practice fortune telling and dispense some forms of charms or amulets under the guise of religion, the Buddha at no time encouraged anyone to practice such things. 
like fortune telling, charms come under the category of superstition, and have no religious value. Yet there are many people today who, because of sickness and misfortunes attribute the cause of their illness and ill luck to the power of charms. When the cause of certain sicknesses and misfortunes cannot be ascertained or traced, many people tend to believe that their problems are due to charms or some other external causes. They have forgotten that they are now living in the 20th century. This is the modern age of scientific development and achievement. Our leading scientists have thrown aside many superstitious beliefs and they have even placed men on the moon. And no matter how strongly traditionalist religions object, the first human clone is almost at our doorstep. All sicknesses owe their origin to either mental or physical causes. In Shakespeare, Macbeth asked a doctor if there was any medicine that could cure his wife and the doctor replied, more needs she the divine than the physician. What he meant was that some diseases can only be cured if the mind is strong enough to face facts in life. Some severe mental disorders manifest themselves in a physical manner as in the case of ulcers, stomach aches, and so on. Of course certain diseases are purely physical and can be cured by a competent doctor. And finally, some inexplicable disorders could be caused by what Buddhists call the ripening of the karmic fruit. This means we have to pay for some evil deed that we had committed in a past life. If we can understand this in the case of some incurable diseases, we can bear it with greater patience, knowing its real cause. This is not fatalism, we must still make all reasonable efforts to find a cure. But we do not expend unnecessary energy feeling sorry for ourselves. This is what we would call a realistic attitude. People who cannot be cured of their sickness are advised to consult a medical specialist and obtain specialized attention. If after having gone through a medical checkup, a person still feels he or she is in need of attention, then he or she may want to seek spiritual guidance from a proper religious teacher. Buddhists are strongly advised against falling into the miserable pit of superstitious beliefs and allowing the mind to be troubled by unnecessary and unfounded fears. Cultivate strong willpower by refusing to believe in the influence of charms. A short meditation course may also prove very helpful to clear the mind of unwholesome thoughts. Meditation leads to strengthen the mental energy. A developed mind automatically leads to a purified and healthy body. The Buddha Dharma is a soothing balm to get rid of sickness of this nature. Consulting mediums. Consulting mediums is not a Buddhist practice. It is just a traditional belief to bring psychological relief. In many countries, people seek the advice and guidance of mediums to overcome their problems in situations which they consider as beyond their comprehension. The medium's help is sought in many ways and for various reasons. In time of sickness when medical help is apparently ineffective, some people may become desperate and turn anywhere to seek solace. At such times, mediums are often consulted. Some people also turn to mediums when they are faced with a complex problem and are unable to find an acceptable solution. Others consult mediums out of greed in order to get rich quickly. Some people believe that when a medium is in a trance, the spirit of a certain god or deity communicates through the medium and offers advice or guidance to those seeking help. Others believe that the trance state is the work of the subconscious mind which surfaces and takes over the conscious mind. Consulting mediums is a fairly common practice amongst the public in certain countries. The Buddhist attitude towards consulting mediums is non-committal. It is difficult to verify whether what the medium conveys is correct or not. The practice of consulting mediums is not a Buddhist practice, it is just a traditional practice that some people believe in very strongly. Consulting mediums is for worldly material gain, the teaching of the Buddha is for spiritual development. However, if people believe what the medium conveys is true, there is no reason for Buddhists to object to such practices, especially if there is no animal sacrifice involved, or others are not disadvantaged. But, if a person really understands and practices the teachings of the Buddha, he or she can realize the nature of the problems. Problems can be overcome without consulting any medium. Dreams and their significance. Life is nothing but a dream. One of mankind's greatest unsolved problems is the mystery of dreams. 
From the very earliest of times people have tried to analyze dreams and have tried to explain them in prophetic and psychological terms. But while there has been some measure of success recently, we are probably no nearer the answers to the baffling question, what is a dream? The great English romantic poet William Wordsworth had a startling concept, that this life we live is merely a dream and that we will awake to the real reality when we die, when our dream ends. Our birth is but a sleep and forgetting. The soul, that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar. A similar concept is expressed in a charming old Buddhist tale which tells of a deva who was playing with some other devas. Being tired, he lay down to take a short nap and passed away. He was reborn as a girl on earth. There she got married, had a few children and lived to be very old. After her death again she was born as a deva amongst the same companions who had just finished playing their game. This story also illustrates the relativity of time, that is, how the concept of time in the human world is very different from time in another plane of existence. What has Buddhism to say about dreams? Just as in every other culture, Buddhism has had its fair share of people who claim to be skilled in interpreting dreams. Such people mislead by exploiting the ignorance of those who believe that every dream has a spiritual or prophetic significance. According to Buddhist psychology dreams are ideational processes which occur as activities of the mind. In considering the occurrence of dreams it is relevant to remember that the process of sleeping can be regarded as falling into five stages. 1. Drowsiness. 2. Light slumber. 3. Deep slumber. 4. Light slumber and 5. Awakening. The significance and the cause of dreams were the subject of discussion in the famous book Melinda Panha or The Questions of King Melinda, written 150 years before the birth of Christ. In which Venerable Nagasena has stated that there are six causes of dreams, three of them being organic, wind, bile and phlegm. The fourth is due to the intervention of supernatural forces, fifth, revival of past experience and sixth, the influence of future events. It is categorically stated that dreams occur only in light slumber which is said to be like the sleep of the monkey. Of the six causes given Venerable Nagasena has stated positively that the last, namely prophetic dreams are the only important ones and the others are relatively insignificant. Dreams are mind-created phenomena and they are activities of the mind. All human beings dream, although some people cannot remember them. Buddhism teaches that some dreams have psychological significance. The six causes mentioned earlier can also be classified in the following manner. I every single thought that is created is stored in our subconscious mind and some of them strongly influence the mind according to our anxieties. When we sleep, some of these thoughts are activated and appear to us as pictures moving before us. This happens because during sleep, the five senses which constitute our contact with the outside world, are temporarily arrested. The subconscious mind then is free to become dominant and to replay thoughts that are stored. These dreams may be of value to psychiatry but cannot be classified as prophetic. They are merely the reflections of the mind at rest. 2. The second type of dream also has no significance. These are caused by internal and external provocation which set off a train of visual thoughts which are seen by the mind at rest. Internal factors are those which disturb the body, e.g. a heavy meal which does not allow one to have a restful slumber or imbalance and friction between elements that constitute the body. External provocation is when the mind is disturbed, although the sleeper may be unaware of it, by natural phenomena like the weather, wind, cold, rain, leaves rustling, windows rattling etc. The subconscious mind reacts to these disturbances and creates pictures to explain them away. The mind accommodates the irritation in a seemingly rational way so that the dreamer can continue to sleep undisturbed. These dreams too have no importance and need no interpretation. 3. Then there are the prophetic dreams. These are important. They are seldom experienced and only when there is an impending event which is of great relevance to the dreamer. Buddhism teaches that besides the tangible world we can experience, there are devas who exist on another plane or some spirits who are bound to this earth and are invisible to us. 
They could be our relatives or friends who have passed away and who have been reborn. They maintain their former mental relationships and attachments to us. When Buddhists transfer merits to departed ones they invite the devas to share the happiness accrued in the merit. Thus they develop a mental relationship with their departed ones. The devas in turn are pleased and they keep a watch over us and indicate something in dreams when we are facing certain big problems and they try to protect us from harm. While we say that devas can protect us, we are not contradicting what we said earlier about the gods being unable to save us. Our spiritual upliftment must be undertaken by ourselves. So, when there is something important that is going to happen in our lives they activate certain mental energies in our minds which are seen as dreams. These dreams can warn of impending danger or even prepare us for sudden overwhelming good news. These messages are given in symbolic terms, much like the negatives of photographs, and have to be interpreted skillfully and with intelligence. Unfortunately, too many people confuse the first two kinds of dreams with these and end up wasting valuable time and money consulting fake mediums and dream interpreters. The Buddha was aware that this could be exploited for personal gain and he therefore warned the monks against practicing soothsaying, astrology, and interpreting dreams in the name of Buddhism. For finally, our mind is the repository of all karmic energies accumulated in the past. Sometimes, when a karma is about to ripen, that is, when the action we did in a previous life or early part of our life is going to experience its reaction, the mind which is at rest during sleep can trigger off a picture of what is going to happen. Again the impending action has to be of great importance and must be so strongly charged that the mind releases the extra energy in the form of a vivid dream. Such dreams occur only very rarely and only to certain people with a special kind of mental makeup. The sign of the effect of certain karmas also appears in our minds at the last moment when we are going to depart from this world. Dreams can occur when two living human beings send strong mental telepathic messages to each other. When one person has an intense desire to communicate with another, he or she concentrates strongly on the message and the person with whom he or she wishes to communicate. When the mind is at rest, it is in an ideal state to receive these messages which are seen as dreams. Usually these dreams only appear in one intense moment because the human mind is not strong enough to sustain such messages over a long period of time. All worldlings are dreamers, and they see as permanent, what is essentially impermanent. They do not see that youth ends in old age, beauty in ugliness, health in sickness, and life itself in death. In this dream world, what is truly without substance is seen as reality. Dreaming during sleep is but another dimension of the dream world. The only ones who are awake are the Buddhas and Arahas as they have seen reality. Buddhas and Arahants never dream. The first three kinds of dream cannot occur in their minds, because their minds have been permanently stilled and cannot be activated to dream. The last kind of dream cannot happen to them because they have eradicated all their craving energy completely, and there is no residual energy of anxiety or unsatisfied desire to activate the mind to produce dreams. The Buddha is also known as the awakened one because his way of relaxing the physical body is not the way we sleep which results in dreams. Great artists and thinkers, like the German Goethe, have often said they get some of their best inspiration through dreams. This could be because when their minds are cut off from the five senses during sleep, they produce clear thoughts which are creative in the highest degree. Wordsworth meant the same thing when he said that good poetry results from powerful emotions recollected in tranquility. Faith Healing Faith healing is psychological approach by activating the immune system. The practice of faith healing is prevalent in many countries. Many people try to influence the public through emotional persuasion designated as faith healing. In order to impress on their patients the efficacy of their healing powers, some faith healers use the name of a god or a religious object to introduce a religious flavor into their faith healing methods. The introduction of religion into faith healing is actually a guise or a decoy to beguile the patient into developing more devotion and to enhance the confidence or faith of the patient in the faith healer. This healing act if performed in public is intended to get converts to a particular religious denomination. In actual fact, in so far as faith healing is concerned, religion is not all that important. 
there are numerous cases of faith healers performing their faith healing acts without using religion at all. A case in point is the science of hypnotism, the practice of which involves no religious aspects at all. Those who associate religion with faith healing are in a way engaging in a subtle form of illusion trying to attract converts to their particular religion by making use of faith healing and describing certain cures as miraculous acts. The methods employed by faith healers are to condition the minds of patients into having a certain mental attitude with the result that certain favorable psychological and physiological changes invariably take place. This attracts the condition of the mind, the heart, the consequent blood circulation and other related organic functions of the body, thus creating an inspiration in the mind which influences the immune system. If sickness is attributed to the condition of the mind, then the mind can certainly be properly conditioned to assist in eradicating whatever illness that may occur. In this context, it is to be noted that the constant and regular practice of meditation can help to minimize, if not to completely eradicate, various forms of illnesses. There are many discourses in the teaching of the Buddha where it was indicated that various forms of sicknesses were eradicated through the conditioning of the mind. Thus it is worthwhile to practice meditation in order to attain mental and physical well-being. Superstitions and Dogmas People ridicule the superstitions of others, while cherishing their own. All ailments have cures but superstitions do not, at least for the most part. And if for some reason or other, any superstition crystallizes into a religion, it easily becomes an almost incurable malady. In the performance of certain religious functions, even intelligent people of today forget their human dignity to accept the most ridiculous, superstitious beliefs. Superstitious beliefs and rituals were adopted to decorate a religion in order to attract the multitude. But after some time, the creeper which is planted to decorate the shrine as it were, outgrows and outshines the shrine. With the result that religious tenets are relegated to the background and superstitious beliefs and rituals become predominant the creeper blocking out the shrine. Like superstition, dogmatic belief also chokes the healthy growth of religion. Dogmatic belief and intolerance go hand in hand. One is reminded of the Middle Ages in Europe with its pitiless inquisitions, cruel murders, violence, infamy, tortures and burning of innocent beings. One is also reminded of the barbaric and ruthless crusades. All these events were stimulated by dogmatic beliefs in religious authority and the intolerance resulting therefrom. Before the development of scientific knowledge, ignorant people had many superstitious beliefs. For example, a lot of people believed that the eclipse of the sun and moon brought bad luck and pestilence. Today we know that such beliefs are not true. Again some unscrupulous religionists encourage people to believe in superstitions so that they can make use of their followers for their own benefit. When people have truly purified their minds of ignorance, they will see the universe as it really is and they will not suffer from superstition and dogmatism. This is the salvation that Buddhists aspire to. It is extremely difficult for us to break up the emotional feeling that is attached to superstition or dogmatic belief. Even the light of scientific knowledge is often not strong enough to cause us to give up the misconceptions. For example, we have noticed for generations that the earth moves round the sun, but experientially we still behold the sun rising, moving across the sky, and setting in the evening. We still have to make an intellectual leap to imagine that we are, in fact, hurtling at great speed around the sun, because we see the earth as static. We must understand that the dangers of dogmatism and superstition go hand in hand with religion. The time has come for wise people to separate religion from dogmatism and superstition. Otherwise, the good name of religion will be polluted and the number of non-believers will be increased, as they have already done.